Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming to the Institute of International European Affairs this afternoon. Um, so uh, just a bit of housekeeping uh, initially to remind you to uh, switch off your mobile phones or put them on silent. Um, and also to remind you that the, uh, the, while well, the opening comments uh, from, the, uh, from our guest speaker will be uh, on the record, the question and answer session afterwards will be subject to the Chatham House rule, which I'm sure you're all familiar with at this stage. So uh, uh, before uh, I introduce uh, the main speaker, could I ask Martina Feeney from Irish Aid to make some introductory remarks? Thank you, Martina. Thanks very much, Barry. And I should explain that I am with the Department of Foreign Affairs. I'm the Human Rights Director in the Department of Foreign Affairs. So um, I have been asked to make some introductory remarks this afternoon. So I suppose I should like to start by welcoming very much Andrew Gilmore to Dublin uh, to this meeting today and indeed to, to, to Ireland in general. I think you're becoming quite a fan of Ireland. This is your second visit to us in a month. You were here uh, in October for the meeting of the Dublin Platform of Frontline Defenders. And I think it's symptomatic of the very close relationship that exists between uh, the human rights mechanism of the United Nations system, particularly the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and Ireland, which has long been recognized as a champion of human rights on the global stage. Um, earlier this year, we had the honor of welcoming the High Commissioner himself, uh, Commissioner uh, Zaid Al Hussein to Dublin to launch in Ireland a Stand Up for Human Rights uh, campaign. And, uh, I got to see Ireland play Austria, and that was very useful. Um, but I think you know the, the, the support that Ireland gives to the OECHR and to human rights, it manifests itself in a number of ways. Obviously, first of all, is the, the stance, the positions that we take, both in Geneva at the Human Rights Council, but also in the United Nations. I think an important thing is that human rights are mainstreamed, that they're not just shoved off to Geneva, but they come into the Security Council, and I think that's a particular issue for you, and that they, they are part of the conversation when we talk about development, and also when we talk about issues like peace and security. Um, and Ireland has long supported mainstreaming of human rights, and um, we also... Um, you know, we also, on the other side of things, we, we do put our money where our mouths are. And we are one of the major donors to OHCHR. In fact, we're a member of the Rubens Group of, of major donors. Uh, and I'm delighted to share with colleagues and friends today that uh, earlier this year, while we, we gave our, 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 our annual payment, an, an annual grant of 2 million euros to OHCHR, which was mostly in unearmarked funding, uh, that we have looked down the back of the sofa and we have found an additional, additional 138,000 euros, which we, we are going to pay to the general fund before the end of the year. Um, Andrew is going to talk to us this morning about the backlash against human rights. And I think it is really relevant and timely that we have this conversation now. As many of you know that um, 10th of December is International Human Rights Day. It marks uh, the anniversary of the adoption of the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. So those of you who are good at maths will realize that we are about to enter onto the 70th year. And this is something that OHCHR has, has um, really wants to highlight this year because, you know, we have to be honest, human rights is under attack worldwide. And we can't be um, cozy and complacent and say, well, we're in Europe, we're exempt from this trend, because the truth is that on the continent of Europe, there are serious challenges to human rights. And so um, for our sake, you know, from a national perspective, we will devote next year's um, annual civil society forum, which will take place on June the 8th, to the whole subject of celebrating the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and at looking at the universality, the interrelatedness, the indivisibility of human rights. The concept that human rights are everybody's rights and that equally we all have an obligation to protect the human rights of others. So um, with that very brief introduction, 
Um, I would like to welcome Andrew um, and invite you to take the floor. It's a little bit low for me, so I'm going to take it from here. Thank you so much, Martina, for those words and for Alan's consistent support, including the most behind the sofa. Is this going to be okay? Um, actually, it's a small room. I think you can hear me. I'm assuming that uh, given the choice of, of title um, of today, and it was my choice, it wasn't foisted on me by Barry or Jill, that nobody decided to drop in um, as a sort of shot in the arm optimism before Thanksgiving weekend. I mean, it's not exactly, it, had, it contains its own spoiler alert. It doesn't say whither human rights, forwards or backwards. It, it, is, it stresses the, the backlash. Anyway, I was, uh, actually yesterday, you, actually you mentioned, thank you Martin, that, that I was here a month ago uh, giving the keynote at Frontline Defenders. Um, it's actually something rather ridiculous that uh, it took my mid-50s to come to Dublin uh, for the first time, and, but it's happy to be back within one month for, to, for my second time. But um, as I said yesterday, the Ireland's contribution has been actually tremendous. Um, particularly, and the leadership is shown, especially on what I was speaking about yesterday at DSA Ireland, um, on the, the nexus between human rights and development, and of course starting with Mary Roberts, Mary Robinson, but and um, but but also actually Jill's husband David Donahue, ambassador in of Ireland in New York until two, until recently, two years ago, played a key, a key role in ensuring that that the SDGs were underpinned by human rights and. Um, but the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals is actually one of the, it's a, it's a fairly rare example of, of, of recent good news in the human rights world. But before getting to the backlash, perhaps I, I could be uh, allowed a very short, subjective, and slightly simplistic um, history of, of human rights over the last century. Well, the Universal Declaration, which as Martina rightly says, um, the 70th anniversary is coming up soon, it came after the, the horrors of total war and, and genocide, but also after the Great Depression. And uh, therefore, there was a, it covers the whole spectrum of human rights, political, civil, economic, social, and cultural. And I think the, the assumption at that time was that human rights w would go in that direction. But with the Cold War, two things happened. There was a, a torpor, um, and human rights became hugely downplayed, but secondly, it went off in two directions, um, into civil political, uh, supported mainly by the countries of the West, and socioeconomic, supported by the Soviet bloc and the post-colonial countries. But, so, uh, nothing happened dramatic in the area of human rights, but then, actually, um, um, by coincidence, I, I joined uh, the human rights movement, um, Amnesty International, uh, as a teenager in 1979, and, of course, we didn't know it then, but that, we were on the cusp of, of a human rights revolution, in fact, and one that lasted several decades. I mean, and if you think, if, if I just tell you who our first prisoners of conscience were, the ones that I would earnestly write letters of about, one was a, a, a guy in the gulag, in a, put in some psychiatric ward, because if you opposed the Soviet system, you had to be insane. Um, and the other was, was some Jehovah's Witness in uh, Greece under the Greek colonels. But of course, within 10 years, um, both the, the regimes of the far right in Latin America and the Greek colonels, but also the Soviet bloc ha had, had ended. So, and that just gives an example of, of how human rights, that, that, that was a major impetus for the explosion of human rights. And, and a whole range of other anti-discrimination areas, dramatic progress was was made in, in, until about till 9/11 probably, and when the when because the terrorist outrages, counterterrorism um, became the, the order of the day, and of course human rights get put on hold in moments like that. But that still wasn't the backlash. The backlash, as far as I'm concerned, really kicked in about three or four years ago, and there isn't a precise time or even a precise cause actually. But but it th that's what happened, and. Um, and, and maybe I could I explain a little bit what, what the backlash looks like. Um, and at the end of, of explaining what it looks like, I, I will suggest a few ways as to what we might do to counter it and, and resist it. Um, but I have to say, and this is a, a second spoiler alert, I, I, I doubt you will find my 
suggested solutions to be anything like commensurate with the scale of the problem that I'm about to explain. But, and that's why, actually, I, I would welcome your suggestions as to what more we can do in addition to what I'm going to say. But so what does it look like? Well, let, let's start with Europe. Um, it, is, it is obviously not by the worst by any means. In fact, it's probably the, the best region in the world in terms of, of um, human rights, but it's the closest. And um, we'll start with um, Poland and Hungary, two, two countries that give a lot of people very serious cause for alarm. Um, with the authoritarian regime, liberal democracy, and the sort of pushback of rights on a number of fronts. Then we have connected to that the rise of far right wing parties in many countries of Europe. Yes, uh, Marine Le Pen lost, but she still got 10.5 million votes, and her concerns are not going away fast. Um, and then there is issues uh, in both Germany and Austria that, that are, are, are alarming as well. And we have to say that as a continent, our response to the refugees and migrants crisis has not been Europe's finest hour, um, although Chancellor Merkel herself showed uh, astonishing generosity and, and nobility of spirit, I think, in, in welcoming refugees in 2015. But, and this is something we, we've just come out with and got, uh, we in the New York, sorry, not New York, the Human Rights Office of the UN has just um, harshly criticized the policy of training the Coast Guard of Libya, which allows or enables uh, people, mi uh, migrants attempting to cross, being handed to the Libyan authorities and put in conditions that are so unspeakable that we can barely talk about them. And they, um, and you will have seen, and it's connected to this, the, the slave market that, that has opened up. So uh, th this, is, this is another aspect of it. And then just across the Irish Sea, we have a, a nation in, in self-inflicted turmoil uh, with, with a threat to many things, including rights. And in the heat of the election campaign, maybe, but still, she said it, the Prime Minister called for human ri rights to be overturned if they get in the way of the fight against terrorism. Now, as uh, Zaid, um, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, commented, um, her remarks were, I'll read it, highly regrettable, a gift from a major Western leader to every authoritarian figure around the world who shamelessly violates human rights under the pretext of fighting terrorism. And indeed, they were. And, in, and within weeks, we had a, a war criminal in Sri Lanka invoking Theresa May, saying, well, hang on, if, if they can claim that excuse, why the hell can't we? And, um, and then we have the national disgrace, known as the British tabloids, uh, whipping up hatred against foreigners, Muslims, judges, even conservative MPs opposed to Brexit. Um, I mean, like many Brits, I, I hung my head in shame last week when I saw Murdoch's son uh, calling on the Taoiseach to shut his gob after having made some perfectly sensible remarks about the, the border. Anyway, that's, that, that's Europe in this whistle-stop tour of the human rights situation, where, in fact, as I said, human rights is still closer to the debate than it is anywhere else in the world. But looking westwards, we, we had for eight years um, an administration that actually put human rights up more than any of its predecessors and supported us in our work. Uh, but in the last year, we have an administration that's headed by someone who says he actively likes torture, not, not reluctantly condones it because it's necessary, but he actively likes it, and he gets cheered when he says it. And that has terrifying connotations, actually. Um, attacks on freedom of the press, the, the mainstream media, attacks on the judiciary, uh, transgender people, international institutions such as ours, the vilification of Mexicans um, somehow presented quite full, without a shred of evidence that somehow they commit more crimes than, than regular Americans, and, uh, and a whole range of uh, and then the, uh, the anti-Muslim feeling and the rise in police violence, particularly against blacks, and, and this sort of extraordinary incarceration rate, 2.4 million Americans un in prison on any day. And um, it looked like last year that there was a, a bipartisan consensus to reduce the numbers, but the current Attorney General Sessions has, uh, is, is pushing back to, have, uh, to restore the minimum mandatory sentences, which will ensure that the figures go up even higher. Turning to the Middle East, we, we saw just this year the 50th anniversary of the 1967 war and the start of the Israeli occupation of Palestinian lands, and a half century of sustained and systematic denial of every single article of the Human Rights, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The entire gamut ha have, have had this sustained 
um, assault on the rights and with not much optimism on that front. Although I'm happy to hear you have one of my UN colleagues coming to talk to this institution. You'll announce that later, I think, Barry. Um, in Syria, uh, we have uh, seen half a million people killed in the last four years, 11 million displaced, atrocities, uh, staggering uh, both in scale and in savagery of, of, of torture, and uh, chemical weapons, deliberate starvation by siege, and barrel bombs and the rest. In Yemen, a coalition supported by Western countries um, that has created, not only through bombing, but by closing the ports, possibly the largest man-made humanitarian catastrophe in, in memory, and with starvation and cholera both very much on the rise. Turkey, which is where my son lives at the moment, working for NGO for Syrians, has taken a dramatic turn for the worst with tens of thousands of people arrested on the flimsiest imaginable evidence after the coup and where there is um, very, very grim stuff going on in the southeast in the sort of war against um, Turkish Kurds. Egypt, where arbitrary arrests, the level of torture and uh, the mass sentencing to death um, for, a, for a single killing of one policeman, a hundred sentenced to death for the killing of one policeman, and nothing short of, of horrifying. I won't go through the, the entire world, but I, I would just mention something that's very evident at the UN. We have the, the great rise of China, uh, politically, militarily, diplomatically, and, and a growing assertiveness of Russia, but um, two very powerful countries at the UN, and yet whose confidence seems strikingly at odds with their fear of civil society, with their fear of human rights defenders and any bit of free press and civil society and, uh, and anything to, that suggests a universal human rights agenda. So that's my not very uplifting and very partial global summary of human rights today. Um, how is the backlash manifested? Um, well, in many ways, and I will briefly go through eight of them. One is NGO laws. Um, Russia started this in 2012, passing a very harsh law against the functioning and financing of NGOs, including human rights NGOs. This has been followed by Israel, Turkey, Egypt, Kenya, India, Ethiopia, and many others. Um, and it's, uh, I'll come back to this. Secondly, um, reprisals against human rights defenders, which is something that I have a particular role in playing. Um, at the UN, and Ireland has been extremely helpful in this regard. Two months ago, I, I addressed the Human Rights Council in Geneva, and I, I said, sorry to quote myself, but it's frankly nothing short of abhorrent that year after year, we're compelled to present cases to you, the Council, of intimidation and reprisals carried out against people whose crime, in the eyes of the governments, was to cooperate with UN institutions. We should see these individuals as the canary in the coal mine, bravely singing until they are silenced by the toxic backlash against people, rights, and dignity as a dark warning to us all. And there's one particular case to give you an example of what I'm talking about, the case of an Egyptian called Ibrahim Matwali, who three years ago lost his son, one presumes tortured to death by the security forces, we don't know that certainly, but who disappeared, and who set up an NGO to deal with people to, like himself, who, who have lost loved ones to, to, um, to the security forces, disappeared. Um, he was coming to Geneva on September the 21st. I, I was planning to meet him there, but he got arrested at the airport and has been, we, we believe, extremely badly tortured himself under the guise of, because he support, if he's opposing the security measures of the government, he must be pro-terrorism. So that's what it's, has happened. And it's a particularly egregious example of what I'm talking about. Related to that are the attacks against UN officials who speak up about, um, about human rights. And we were mentioning just now, just now um, Agnes Kalamar, who's the special rapporteur on extrajudicial um, executions. Um, President Duterte of Philippines, um, the man who has, um, whose security forces have killed perhaps 10,000 either innocent bystanders or petty criminal and drug users, um, and encouraged his soldiers to rape village women, but only up to three. And, um, but he threatened Agnes publicly that if I see her, I will slap her. I mean, that, that's a head of state talking about a, a UN official um, because she had 
she had raised questions about these mass executions. Not mass, the individual, but the numbers of them. 10,000 is certainly a mass. And, it, and, these, and the similar countries are doing everything to oppose our budget, um, which is why we need Ireland to step into the breach, and, and many others, um, and stopping me from talking, and, and many other ways that, that they are, this is a, a form of the, um, the, the backlash. And number four is, I would say, specifically the, the backlash against women, women's rights in many countries. Uh, women should know their place, um, and, and men should control their bodies. And that, that is, uh, we are particularly worried about the backlash against women's rights. Number five is the, the, the cruel scapegoating of, of minorities. I, I mentioned Europe and the United States already, but it's, it's not just there. Uh, look at the Rohingya in Burma as, as an example of, again. Six would be counterterrorism, where we have country after country pursuing what I would call the Strelnikov school of response. It's, it's, it's the best scene in my favorite ever film, um, Dr. Zhivago, when Zhivago is confronting the, uh, the Red Army commander, Strelnikov, and he says, Look, you burned their village. And he said, well, the, the village was um, providing horses to the White Army. And Zhivago says, yeah, but it was the wrong village. They, they said it was another village. He said, ah, a village gave horses to the White Army. A village was burned. The point was made. Zhivago replies, your point, their village. But so many countries fight terrorism in this brutal and bovine way that actually almost invariably leads to the creation of more terrorists than there were before they started fighting terrorism um, through bombings um, and not caring how many civilians get killed, mass arrests and detention and um, torture and the crushing of dissent, human rights, um, civil society and, and the media, all under the pretext of fighting terrorism. And the last manifestation of the, back, black, um, of the backlash that I mentioned, number eight, would be the tendency to dismiss human rights, either as interference in internal affairs, and China is, is a maestro at using that argument in particular, that, that if we mention human rights in that country, then we are going against the UN Charter, which prohibits um, external interference in internal affairs, um, or as an attempt and Russia uses this argument that invoking human rights is just an excuse to overthrow regimes the West doesn't like. Um, or alternatively, just e even if they don't use those, or, or, to, sorry, to, or to impose Western values on, on countries that, that don't want Western values. So human rights is presented as a, a Western agenda rather than as a universal one. Or then there's another sort of subset of people who, or countries who, who dismiss human rights as something, okay, it's not a bad thing, but it's a luxury. It has to wait until the great moment when we have ended the conflict or achieved development or imposed security, um, which for us is completely the wrong way around because we are convinced, and we have a lot of evidence to back that up, that development is not sustainable and peace is certainly not sustainable unless it is anchored in human rights. Indeed, I, I recently... Um, challenge members of the Security Council if they could come up with one, one internal conflict that's on their agenda where human rights was not, on, was not actually the root cause of, of that conflict. And with the implication being that if, if, the, if human rights is at, or lack of human rights is at the root of the problem, then it's got to be part of the solution as well. So what can we do about it? Um, and I mentioned earlier that it, these are not going to be commensurate, but uh, we do have a few um, tools and a few paths we can have to. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, and number one is to, would be to defend the defenders. Now, we have in the room Andrew Anderson, who, who is the director of Frontline Defenders, which perhaps more than any other organization is at the heart of getting to, or, or whose mandate it is, and does tremendous work in supporting the heroic peoples who are, as the name suggests, on the front line. And we need, there needs to be more than front line defenders, or they need to be given more, more means, because it is a growing problem, and we have to do something more about it. But we have to be careful, too, because we can't play into the gender or, or the rhetoric that is used by many of the countries violating human rights, that these NGOs are a tool of foreign powers. So it has to, this support has to be very smart, but it does have to be um, increased. So that's one. Number two is, is speaking out. Now, one can take the view that rogue regimes and other governments that 
wantonly violate the rights of their citizens don't care about whether people like me or any of the rest of us speak out, but they do. I mean, for example, um, Egypt went nuts when Human Rights Watch ca came up a few weeks ago with a very strongly argued um, report on the widespread torture that goes on. And I, I'd say one of the few consolations of getting regularly berated by angry ambassadors, um, so taking the diplomatic equivalent of being taken behind the bike shed, is that after we issue our so strong statements and reports, and then they come, and, and they, but they show by their anger and their complaints about me or, or they to, that, to the Secretary General, it, it does at least show that we have struck a nerve in calling them out for it, and that they do, in fact, feel some shame. Otherwise, they wouldn't be reacting quite, with quite such uh, dramatic anger when, when we call them out on what we know is going on. So speaking up does help. Thirdly, is it would be economic power, um, the boycotts of goods, um, and I, I would say particularly tourism. I mean, I, I especially like to suggest that when governments invoke the need to brutally repress people in order to crush terrorism so that tourists can feel safe, I would say that this is a le legitimate thing, legitimate uh, path to take. I mean, shouldn't tourists be aware as they're idyllically scuba diving um, that a few miles away there are people undergoing unspeakable torture and, the, and that the, the guys ordering the torture are invoking the safety of tourists as a, as a pretext for doing that. I, th I think tourists should be made aware and, and, I, and, I, and there are some countries that I think that would have a, a very salutary effect on. Number four is um, funding human rights. Now we have, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cliche, but it started in 2005, but, but there is a truth to it at the UN. There is no peace without security. Sorry, no, no peace without development. No development without peace, and neither peace nor development without respect for human rights. Um, which, and there are, and people talk about the three pillars of the UN, but these three pillars are not really three pillars because our pillar, the human rights arm, gets 3%, the other two getting 97 of course. But human rights isn't free, and it doesn't even come cheap. If we're going to deal with this, there has to be some rebalancing um, so that uh, other, uh, 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 so that people pursuing development understand that actually they're going to get better results in the development if there's a more of a human rights approach. Number five would be sort of actions, individual and collective. Um, I mean, it sent, I think, an amazing signal. I mean, when, when German, the German population went to the stations to meet refugees in 2015. And it, I, I was personally deeply moved in January this year when thousands of Americans spontaneously flocked to international airports when the infamous Muslim travel ban was announced then and there, and therefore there were people in the air who, who fell victim to it. But thousands of Americans went to the airport to go and provide them with legal aid and other assistance. Um, and then, of course, the, the women's marches in the US and elsewhere are, are inspirational. So the, this is another measure. Number six, um, and, and I suppose this, this is the, my last one, uh, my last proposal, but, and it's aimed at the human rights movement ourselves and the governments, including Ireland, who support us. We, we need to better un understand what it is we're up against um, and to change our rhetoric to show that we understand that without ceding our, the moral ground. Um, and we have to understand why people are turning to xenophobic and populist rhetoric and siren calls. And this, this is crucial because the populists are always, always opposed to human rights. Because, for, I mean, for many reasons, but one very simple one is that they always have to pick out a scapegoat, uh, usually from already the weakest, uh, most vulnerable sectors of society um, to blame for society's ills. And so that alone, but there are other reasons why. So th as they whip up hatred, we have to understand why it is and then present alternatives to address the insecurities that make these populists so attractive to, to so many people at the moment. And in that sense, human rights people need to do a better job at showing how human rights are in the interests of what people cons who consider themselves as ordinary feel. It's not just about prisoners, LGBT, disabled and migrants, although all of those should be absolutely at the top of our agenda, but we do have to show that it's not just, um, not just minorities that, are, that benefit from human rights, but the population as a whole. And perhaps we'll be using, I hope we will be using the, the, the whole 70th anniversary of the UDHR, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
to, to make that point. Now, these are all things we can do, I think, to address the backlash. And the fact that in um, High Commissioner Zaid's words last month, more and more leaders no longer even pretend to care about rights, seduced as they are by the masculine posturing of power relationships. Now, I, I'm a historian by training, but I, I never subscribe to the, to the Whig view of history, that society inevitably progresses, progresses towards a better state. The backlash is real, and I don't know if it is a, a temporary blip in the march towards progress, or if it's a more permanent reversal. I obviously sincerely hope the former. What I do know is that the backlash can only be countered, that we can push the pendulum back in the way we want it to, only if those who want human rights show the same degree or more guile and determination as those who probably don't want human rights. So, all right, it, it's Friday afternoon. I've <laughs> spoken too long, and I wouldn't want you going away feeling too depressed and thinking that sort of a weekend with Finnegan's Wake would be light relief compared to, <laughs> compared to what I've been talking about. But in fact, this is actually, has been a good week for human rights. And I think I've ever said that before. And so it's not something I, I say. I, I genuinely believe it. And I, I'd say in two words what it is, um, Maladic and Mugabe. Now, it's been 22 years since the butcher of Srebrenica, um, the architect of the genocide, was convicted. And it took, him 20, took 20 years for him to be convicted and sentenced. Um, and it's been 34 years since the mass killings up, up to 20,000 in Matabililand. But he, too, was kicked out. So the wheels of justice indeed turn slowly. But to mix the metaphor, they do get their man in the end. So as I said, this has been a good week for, for human rights, and I'm a Scotsman, but tonight in Dublin I'll be drinking the Irish variant of our drink, um, <laughs> still wondering what the redundant E is doing in there, but still, uh, and, I, <laughs> and I'll be dr drinking to the fact that maybe, as, as Churchill said in 1942, it's, it's not the end, it's not even the beginning of the end, but maybe it's the end of the beginning. I'm talking about our struggle to contain and then reverse human rights. So thank you very much indeed for allowing me to put my case. Thank you.